Hi. Welcome to Vera. This is the second event we're having here as part of our series called Sea Justice. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here. My name is Mathilde Glenn. I'm a senior program associate here at Vera. I work out of the New Orleans office. And so I'm particularly excited about today's talk because we're going to explore the intersection between criminal justice and art. And that's something that we've been doing a lot of thinking about in our New Orleans office. I'll tell you the reason why very briefly. Um, in New Orleans, it's first, uh, New Orleans has one of the highest incarceration rates in this country. Uh, we put more people in jail than almost any other city. Um, and a lot of our work is focused on that. And so a new jail was built in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And it was supposed to be a three-building complex. And there has been a lot of work done to try to limit the number of beds that are built. Because we know that if these beds are built, they're going to be filled. And if those beds are filled, then we can't work on reducing the use of incarceration, reducing the use of jail. So we've been thinking a lot about those two buildings that have already been built and the space in the middle that's right now is empty, but is meant to be another building to incarcerate people. And we've been thinking about how to reclaim the space and how to use art to do that. So that's why I'm so interested in this talk, because I think Mark's work is so connected to that. Um, and it's really resonating with our work in New Orleans. So Mark Strenquist, who is our speaker today, um, is an artist, but is also an agent of change. And in all the work he's doing, uh, working with various people from kids who are going through the criminal justice system, police officers, community groups, lawyers. Um, he's really using his art to bring people together, encourage them to have conversations, and at the end of the day, to really change practices in our criminal justice system. And that's actually the work we do at Vera, right? So we might not use art, we might use research and technical assistance, then at the end of the day, our goals are so aligned. And at the end of the day, we're serving the same people, and we're trying to improve the system, the same system for the same people. So I'm so excited about this talk. Um, we'll, uh, Mark will be talking for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, so please join me in welcoming Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so more than anything, what I'm going to talk about is not how art can save the world or why you know any of these things, but how there are certain strategies and tactics that myself and many others are using around the country um, to connect those most affected by the criminal justice system with those in power to make changes um, to that system. So this is not about, I don't work in a way where I take pictures of people being victimized. I work with people most affected to amplify their own expertise. Because I believe that those in the system, their families, uh, their loved ones, um, have an immense amount of um, expertise, knowledge, um, and visions for how to truly transform the system in a way that could uh, benefit all of us. Um, so at the core, um, there's this Solinsky quote that I always go back to thinking, you know, again, not looking at people as unfortunate um, or as victims, but as people with an immense amount of potential that society, for whatever reason, uh, very uh, infrequently listens to. Um, when I was an undergraduate three years ago uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University, I started a project called Windows from Prison, where basically I was going into um, uh, Richmond City Jail, doing workshops with men and women there. Um, to create images with words, and I'll explain what that looks like in a second, but Angela Davis and her book, Our Prisons Obsolete, I think this quote is, is, is a call to action for almost all of my work um, in that she's saying that not only do prisons function in a way that 
make huge portions of our society invisible to a, a, to a large part of society, but importantly, by sweeping people under the rug, um, they make the social issues, the systemic issues that you all are ha always talking about um, invisible as well. So with my work, how can I not only work with people most affected to tell their own stories and to bring those stories into places where they've either been silenced or excluded, whether those are schools or police departments or museums or um, uh, political centers of power, um, but to importantly use that as a starting point um, to, to talk about the systemic issues, to talk about those other layers, how uh, the criminal justice system ripples out and affects all of us. Um, so windows in prison began with a simple question. If you had a window in your cell, what place from your past would it look out to? The men and women that we, I worked with uh, wrote detailed letters about uh, a specific location that they wished they could see, and then I would go to that place, make a photograph, bring it back, um, we would have a workshop, and then we would exhibit these. Um, I was an undergrad, I was a uh, junior in college at the time, um, which I think is important because for so many students that I, I, I thankfully get to talk to, you know, it's an amazing time to be doing the work you're most passionate about. Um, so when I would go to somebody's location, like this place, a gentleman asked me to go to his home. Um, you read his letter, he says, looking through the window, I can see this long hallway. My sister and I running halfway down the hallway and sliding the remaining of the way in our socks. At the age of 12 years old, my sister six, seeing the world through my innocent eyes, this hallway was a safe haven. This hallway was filled with much laughter and fun. No worries, I miss this place. So when I say photography is a social practice, what I mean is that, in the same way that a lot of research is, um, the act of making this photograph forced me to go to somebody's house, knock on the door, and meet his sister, who was now 20 years older uh, than when um, she was in his letter, and, and, and spend two hours talking with her. So the photograph is important to the individual that requested it, but more than anything, the act of making the image was its own classroom that brought me into a space that my class or race might typically uh, exclude myself from. Um, likewise, you know, a lot of photography tries to tell so much, right? The picture tells more than a thousand words. This project tries to do the opposite. The image itself tells us very little other than this person maybe likes mallard ducks um, and vinyl siding. Um, but if you go to their words, if you go to their, their voice, you, you learn that this, this image was requested because the woman wanted to, to envision herself on the other side um, of, of, of the, the, the windows to, to envision herself playing with board games with her, her daughters on a, on a winter's day. So it does much about sort of inverting who's telling whose story much about telling, uh, creating a new kind of prison photography that don't include, uh, you know, the tropes and stereotypes that we often see, um, and a place that privileges the voice and the history and the experiences and visions of those most impacted by the system. So again, I'm thinking a lot about how photography is itself an excuse and a vehicle to bring people together, so um, to, to understand each other in deep ways. Um, so me going to that woman's house, knocking on the door, and having an hour, two hour long conversation about how incarceration has not only affected her brother, but how it's affected her own life uh, from an economic and emotional perspective. Um, so I wanted to break that open and, and, and include a lot more people in that process, because I saw that as a, a really powerful way to develop empathy. So in D.C., if you're incarcerated, you get sent into the federal system. You could be incarcerated in North Dakota, California, Texas, and if you're like most people that are incarcerated from D.C. from a lower socioeconomic background, the odds of going, um, the odds of seeing your family, your loved ones, your friends for a day, for years, for decades, um, without touch, without a hug, without a kiss, uh, it's incredibly barbaric to me. Um, so we worked with high school students to write letters to people who are from D.C. but incarcerated all over the country um, and ask them the same question, and then went all over the city to make these images, mailed them back, and then I'll go through some of these real quick. You should see some of the images. Brought them into public spaces. So that Angela Davis quote of how do we not only make the stories of those most affected, but make the human beings that have been made invisible to make their voices um, who have been silenced or excluded uh, uh, visible in public spaces. We blow them up on large banners. We do these installations. But importantly, you know, art is often used as sort of, you know, we, we Create, as an artist, you create a body of work, uh, you finish it, you frame it, you kind of seal it, in some ways you kill it, um, and then you put it in a gallery, you're done. Um, for these projects, we use exhibitions not as ending points, but starting points. 
as stages to bring lots of people together um, from policy experts to formerly incarcerated individuals uh, to use the exhibition as a stage to, to have workshops, to have events. Um, in this case, uh, this was uh, from an exhibit at a, at a, uh, a university. Um, for six months, we worked with different departments. We had women studies students doing research on the impact of incarceration on women. They gave that research to art students who then turned them into these beautiful uh, books that were passed out in hundreds, uh, finding ways to, 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 to work with students to make their expertise um, really tangible. And, and we took prison bed sheets, pulped them in blenders, and, and turned them into a giant sheet of paper, and then uh, created a, we geolocated every jail or prison um, in the U.S., which looks like a horrifying Verizon map. Um, so finding ways to, to, to use the exhibit as a, as, a, as a sort of a catalyst to bring all these different departments, you know, hundreds of students helped make this exhibit happen. Um, we had lots of programming, showed films uh, about, you know, in this case, women who had defended themselves against, uh, against sexual violence and who were incarcerated for defending themselves, still in and silence. Um, but importantly, then had women who had had that experience themselves come and speak about their own experiences. So always finding ways where people most affected are the stewards of their own story. Um, you know, you can see literally how the exhibit creates a stage for other events. Here we have formerly incarcerated individuals from Free Minds Book Club, an awesome group in D.C., speak about what it's like to um, be in solitary confinement, what it's like to be thousands of miles away from your family or friends for years. Um, you know, artists work in galleries often or museums, those spaces, like policy uh, sort of spaces, are self-selecting. Not everybody's going to read your brief. Not everybody's going to go to a gallery. So how do we find ways to get out of those spaces? Uh, newspapers, like the one that is up here, um, is one way in which we disseminate um, uh, the work that we create into schools, into uh, political centers of power, um, all sorts of places. Um, we did a recent version of Windows in Prison at the New School here in New York, uh, where we worked with women at Rikers, um, and then created these sort of mobile classrooms where um, each team uh, that was creating an image for a woman that was incarcerated at Rikers um, had a formerly incarcerated individual, a professional photographer, a professional journalist, a policy reform advocate, and a, a variety of students. And so they worked together to go from the New School to various locations around the city to create an image requested by a woman at Rikers. Um, but importantly, along the way, they're interviewing people about uh, the root causes of incarceration. They're sharing their own experiences and perspectives. You can see how the process of making this photograph is this mobile classroom that can bring in all these different voices and perspectives. And then exhibiting those together. So you have the images that they created and the letters written by the women at Rikers, but also the messages written by all the participants. We flipped the prompt. We worked with a uh, the group Philadelphia Site, which is an uh, HIV advocacy group in um, uh, Philadelphia, uh, to send 5,000 blank postcards to prisoners across the country asking if you could create a window in the prison walls, what would you want the world to see? This is a project that basically costs uh, $30 uh, to, to print a bunch of blank postcards and hundreds of prisoners around the U.S. participated. You know, this is about asking them to be photographers where cameras can often or can, can rarely, if ever, go. You know, if you could, could create a window in the prison walls, what would you want us to see? So they created images and they wrote captions on the back. Um, PBS did a, a thing on this. So, again, something that was so simple in, in some ways can get, you know, can, can have a huge impact. And, and, and that, that tiny piece of paper can be weighted with so much. Um, Performance Statistics, which is a new initiative I, I helped direct and started a, a year and a half ago. Um, you know, Windows in Prison, I began in college, and it's been all over the U.S. It's been, we've done versions in Canada and elsewhere, um, and it's connected with thousands of people, uh, connected the stories and the voices of those incarcerated with thousands of people around the U.S., but it was always more about an, um, almost like trying to create a educational experience that could develop empathy and share stories where they had been, you know, uh, silenced. Um, and a couple years ago, the Sentencing Project put out a report to the United Nations saying that unless things radically change, one of every three black men and one of every six Latino and one of every six, 16 white men will be incarcerated in their lives. And that statistic was so jarring um, that I felt like education was not enough, that you know, if I'm going to try to engage and use my whatever skill sets I have to try to engage these issues, that it needed to go beyond that. 
Um, but that, importantly, those statistics, while jarring, were also leaving out the human beings um, that, that were wrapped up in that system. And so performing statistics started as a, with, not, not with a, um, I don't do art to communities. I, I propose questions and then work with, uh, in this case, dozens of, of community organizations um, and partners to help answer those. Um, often artists come in, they helicopter in, and they do a project and leave. Um, this was about developing um, and has, uh, I think, been very effective at developing a cross sort of network of, of partners from police departments to abolitionist groups and, and everything in between and beyond. Um, so how would criminal justice reform differ if it was led by incarcerated youth? And then how could socially engaged artists, educators, and Virginia's leading policy advocates support and ensure the success of the youth division for a more just society? So I'm just, I love Paul Freire. He's like my hero. <laughs> um, I love this quote of, no pedagogy, and I believe no art form of advocacy can be truly liberated um, while it remains distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunate. Um, so much of this work is about listening, it's about amplifying, it's about being megaphones for people who have, um, I think, been so silenced by the system and who have so much to offer. And that the process of that is then not only, you know, challenging those narratives and challenging those stereotypes, but helping people develop their own ability to be transformative agents. So for this last summer, um, performing statistics, which is, again, a plug if you haven't gotten one, the beautiful newspaper up front. Um, for eight weeks, uh, we were able to work with a group of youth who were able to leave their detention center. Um, they were able to wear their own clothes. There were no guards in the room. We're, if we're going to talk about alternatives to incarceration, how can we also be modeling what we're advocating for? So the, the project itself is a diversion program. Um, every week, the youth worked with different artists to learn different skill sets from photography and soak screen to going to radio. Um, uh, stations to record uh, public services announcements about what they wish people knew about uh, incarcerated youth. Those uh, radio pieces are actually available in your newspaper. Uh, you can call a phone number with any kind of phone and hear the youth speak directly to you. Um, the photography projects, sorry the slides are not super um, visible. But. but importantly, every week they were also working with um, the top legal advocates from Legal Aid Justice Center, the Just Children program there. So the youth were learning about, um, you know, the criminal justice system, and then they were also simultaneously learning different creative skills, and so combining their personal experiences, this new uh, statistical and criminal justice knowledge with these creative skill sets, combining those to make these really powerful media campaigns. And again, this is not art that ends in a wall. It's art that's been being created to be deployed by communities. So posters and T-shirts that have been, you know, worn and held by thousands. Um, you know, the exhibitions are all very active where we're, we're still screening the, the work that the youth made. Uh, we're disseminating information. The statistical context is, is, is always present, um, so it's very research heavy. Um, the center of the exhibit was a to scale model of a jail cell, six by eight by eight, where the youth had wood burn carved messages into the floorboards. Um, and the bars that you can see here, we became sort of this community think tank where we we're asking people to add their own responses to the question, what can we do to create a world where no youth are locked up? And then we use the exhibit, this is Andy Block who directs uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice in Virginia, um, which I love him sitting underneath that sign. Um, uh, we use the exhibit as a way to uh, have different public forums, Brian Stevenson, uh, many others, uh, the police chief came to our exhibit. I can talk all day about how much expertise these youth have, but when the police chief comes in and he's floored and wowed and he says, you know, within five minutes my officers need to see this, that's validating and, and I think that's where I think art can really support these movements. Um, so we worked with the chief to do our first set of training last October where we used the exhibit and the team made their own police training manuals. Um, it was like a uh, multi very like arts integrated, a ton of different people speaking and using the exhibit as a classroom to train every police recruit in the city. Um, where else are incarcerated youth training uh, the police officers in their city? Uh, we just met with the, the, the department last week. Uh, we're going to spend the next year training all 700 active duty officers, which is really exciting. Um, and I can talk more about what the trainings entail. Um, 
you know, again, how do we get the work out of out of the sort of uh, self-selecting art spaces? So we we did a thing called the Justice Parade for Incarcerated Youth, um, where we had um, basically turned all the amazing art that the youth made into a people-powered uh, art exhibit. So hundreds of people came out to support. The teens wrote their own protest chants. We we worked with musicians to translate those into these amazing performances where we had drummers and these horn players. Uh, singing the words of the youth, literally becoming their megaphone, um, bringing their voices to the General Assembly and then uh, of Virginia's General Assembly, and then marching down. There's me in November in short shorts. Climate change, it's horrible. Um, marched down uh, Richmond's main street, uh, blocking traffic during rush hour for an hour and a half without an arrest, without any altercation. Uh, it's amazing when you call something a parade, which you can get away with. Um, <laughs> Just one anecdote, this is Gina Lyles. The project would not have been possible without her. Um, much of the project was about identifying and supporting people like Gina, who was in foster care, juvenile justice system, and the adult prison system. Uh, and more importantly, she's also an amazing mother and poet and activist. So she worked with us all summer with the youth. She was an amazing mentor. We had a ton of, we privileged artists of color to be teachers because it's important that people see living blueprints of themselves. Um, and, and uh, worked with a multitude of formerly incarcerated individuals to, um, to be mentors in the program. So who is in the room is as important as what you're talking about or what you're creating uh, within our work. Um, you see the photos being turned into these giant protest banners that we marched down the street, the t-shirts with the silk screens. Again, thinking about how you know, these, these pieces of art can be translated into a multitude of forms so that they can then trespass into the city streets or Virginia Museum of Fine Arts at an exhibit where 20,000 people saw the art of the youth in two days, um, to the General Assembly where we played the audio of the youth over the microphone, literally t using their audio to testify um, uh, during the budget hearing uh, last month. Um, there's some of our amazing team. There's our beautiful newspaper. I'm gonna, not gonna talk anymore about it. Um, <laughs> So what's next? Uh, we just got a half million dollar grant in November. So excited, um, which means three years of funding, more opportunities to hire formerly incarcerated individuals to be the amazing advocates that they are already doing in our communities, but now they get paid. Um, developing a youth advocacy network that will support youth as they get out. So we're working with them in the system. As they get out, there'll now be uh, ways that they'll pay the opportunities for them to stay involved in the project and continue to create amazing work and take their work um, all over the state. Um, expanding our police training, uh, we're modeling it over the next year to train every officer in the city, and then we're going to document that and try to do that around the country. So we would love, if anybody's doing pol uh, policing work, love to talk to you about um, if you're interested. Um, and last project I'm going to talk about, I think I have 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah, cool. Um, I'm, I'm going fast. I did like, I like, I, I, I sent the PDF in and it was like 125 and they're like, what are you doing? So now I cut a bunch out and now I went, and I went too fast. But the People's Paper Co-op is based in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I, I try to talk about mass incarceration and not talk about reentry. I think it's a huge disservice. You know, I'm sure you all know the numbers, but something like 700,000 people are released every year. Uh, like seventy-five percent of those will be end up back in the system will be rearrested within three years. Um, in Philly, uh, where we work, one of every five people have a criminal record. Um, but obviously, uh, are disproportionately impact communities of color um, and lower socioeconomic communities. Um, and the other thing about Philadelphia is that your entire arrest record is publicly available. So anything you were ever arrested, not convicted of. Is publicly available. So you apply for a job. If you're in a community where stop and frisk is prevalent. Um, you might have a 10-page rap sheet and three convictions on there. Or if a police officer throws 10 charges at you for one thing, so you'll take a plea uh, deal, like 97% of cases in the U.S., um, you, all of those charges will still be on there. So we work with civil rights lawyers, Philadelphia Lawyers for Social Equity, to hold free community clinics. Um, where people can begin the expungement process for free, uh, saving them thousands of dollars. And then, you know, if you work with one of these lawyers, you're literally reenacting and reliving the worst days of your life often, because you're going through every single arrest. 
Um, and so what we do is, at the end of that process, you then take that criminal record and you that the printout of it that you've just sort of gone through, and you tear it up, you put it in a blender, you make a beautiful paper smoothie, and you turn it into these incredibly gorgeous new sheets of blank paper uh, for you to rewrite your, your your narrative. So we ask people, when people look at your criminal record, what about you as a human being don't they see, which is where the Polaroids come about, and then they write a new story about what this this new moment for their life will mean. Um, and importantly, you know, so many social services are dehumanizing in and of themselves. Um, and the way that the environment is set up and the way that people are interacting with, with the, those they're serving. And so we work with the lawyers to transform that experience into a space that's an organizing space uh, where the our sort of co-op, which is a group of formerly incarcerated individuals that helps produce the project, we're facilitating a bunch of different interactions. Um, this year, for instance, we're using um, the clinic space, which there's a waiting room. Um, people often wait like 30 minutes to an hour before working with a lawyer uh, to work with people to rewrite their own, rewrite the expungement law. So again, looking at people most affected uh, to, to come up with solutions to these systemic issues. Um, these are just some of the paper quilt pieces um, from people's criminal records that they've created. Uh, we're creating a giant paper quilt of that that's going to be brought to Harris Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the state capital, for a big event in about a year. Um, and we also, uh, our co-op members, um, run a collective paper-making business. We work with Whole Foods. They give us the beautiful flowers that they would have thrown away, um, and we turn them into gorgeous paper. Um, if you need thank you cards. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of it's about, this is our awesome storefront in North Philly. Um, Faith, who is not, oh, she was right here. Faith, right here, uh, started as an intern in the program. Um, she, you know, for a variety of reasons, has been massively impacted by her criminal record. Um, and she now is the lead fellow. She started an internship program uh, with local halfway houses. So the, the business, the co-op, is actually co-run by a bunch of women um, that are amazing. And they're spending the whole year creating a resource guide for other women. So you can see how sort of the project brings people into the fold, helps them sort of develop uh, leadership skills, um, and then nurtures that um, to, to continue to be community advocates. And so that's a lot. But basically, you know, I think the three different projects that I showed, um, Winners from Prison, is, is, is very much about working with people currently incarcerated, you know, to create a new narrative and bringing that narrative into public space to create a humanistic entry point into what are super divisive, complex, and systemic issues, right? If we, there's a quote I love that people have to be first seen as, as living before they can be seen as lost. So we have to understand people as human beings before we can talk about the systemic issues that lead to them. Otherwise, we'll still be dehumanizing them in a variety of ways. Um, <laughs> But it kind of stops at that, at, uh, that educational experience. Performing statistics and the People's Paper Co-op are much more about providing either direct, urgently needed legal services and using those legal services as a way to organize people uh, to reimagine the justice system and create powerful artifacts. Um, and performing statistics, again, is about looking to people most affected to be community advocates and using art to connect their voices with people in power. Um, that was a whole lot of images. I'm going to stop talking and just if you have any questions. Sarah. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'm we have a microphone. Uh, my name is Leslie Sternlieb, and I'm on the board of Rehabilitation Through the Arts based in New York, and we do uh, theater productions and writing and art and all kinds of creative expression in five prisons in New York. And one of the things that uh, we find to be uh, a factor in terms of working with our inmates and telling the story is that we are afraid of being considered to be political. and. Um, we steer clear of anything advocacy oriented because we do work with the Department of Corrections. We do work with the state of New York and you are sending a very clear political message uh, for reform uh, and yet you also have your place inside. 
And I'd like you to share your perspective on that because it is something that many organizations are are cautious about uh, regarding any kind of uh, political um, action growing out of the work. Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say for different projects, I would answer that question differently. Uh, Windows and Prison is often in partnership with educational initiatives already occurring in um, in, 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 in prisons. And for that, you know, like you kind of acknowledged, there's a lot of respect that you need, and there's a huge responsibility to sort of honoring the trust that's been built between those organizations and the prison, which could be cut at any second. Um, and so you don't want to come in and like just shake things up and whatever. But um, for performing statistics, you know, we went into it, again, with questions. And we said, and we were very clear, we wrote a, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with the Richmond Detention Center saying, this is about listening to youth, uh, about their perspectives. Um, we're not going to censor or silence any of those. Um, and they were okay with that. And I also think that, you know, because of, I think that, you know, would two years ago this project have been possible? Maybe not. I think, like, would the police chief agree to allow incarcerated youth in an exhibit um, run by, uh, you know, advocates and artists, uh, train all of his officers, um, and publicly support that? No, I think that's a lot. A lot of that has to do with the, the climate that's been pushed by activists all over the, the country. Um, so I think part of it is sort of the context that we're in, and then part of it is being clear, um, you know, and, and identifying shared goals. It's in the best interest of the police department um, to to better relationships with with the community that that they're in, um, and so we're trying to find a way to do that in, in, in a in a way that's actually effective. Um, but I think just being clear and upfront. And if, also, I think if I went in saying, I'm going to make a film about how messed up uh, the criminal justice system is, the, the department would immediately shut that down, obviously. But there's something that uh, you can kind of, you can, art, it, it's, it's almost just art, you know? Like I think it, <laughs> you can kind of trespass a little. So I don't know if that helped answer. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the reaction of police officers to mm. this work. Yeah. So, oh, did you want me to? Add? I can. Well, my question, question. My question was similar. So I'm Ashley Jackson with LISC, um, and a lot of the work that we do is sort of reclamation of properties. And so I'm co-signing your perspective on doing things with the community in terms of two, because when you do it two, that's not a recipe for sustainable change. Um, so my question definitely was connected to hers. Is, I'd imagine you didn't go into, you know, the criminal justice system in Virginia and people were like, yes, like on the law enforcement side, yes, we definitely want, you know, the youth to work with us and, you know, inform training among the police force. What were those early conversations like with law enforcement and how did you develop buy-in and um, support from them, especially yeah. since tensions are high and, and um, they're, they're dramatic across the country, not just in Virginia, but across yeah. the nation? So first, thank you for that. And you said LISC? Yeah. LISC, uh, you should look up what does transformation look like on your all's national page, because they just did a People's Favorite Co-op feature with Faith, and she looks amazing. So LISC is awesome. There, yeah. Um, so great question. So basically, you know, you're seeing 20 slides from performing statistics. That's a two and a half year long organizing project that took a lot of relationship building, like you're saying. Um, basically, we spent the first year doing a ton of different community meetings. You know, again, starting with questions, not answers, starting with uh, sort of a basic idea with not a preconceived, I, um, sort of fully, fully realized project. And I think that helped not only allow for people like the police department and advocates and others uh, to find a place within it, you know, where they felt like this was their own um, and, and uh, had room within it to make it their own. Um, but we held a lot of community forums, and in those, we're very strategic about asking certain questions. So, for instance, Virginia, the Center for Public Integrity last year released a report saying that Virginia sends more youth to law enforcement than any state in the country. 
So off the bat, that made everybody, especially Richmond's the second worst county in the state uh, for referrals, school-based referrals. So the police department had to answer that. So there's this climate of like, there's shit, oh, excuse me, stuff is really messed up, um, we need to fix it. And then all of a sudden there's this community forum about police, community relationships, and that gave us a way to kind of call the police off, police chief out on that and also be like, oh, and we're doing this program with youth, they're gonna create their own police training manual. And in a public stage, the chief said, I wanna be part of that. And not only was that exciting, we created which is to say that it didn't start from an antagonistic perspective. It started from a place of welcoming um, input, welcoming uh, ideas, and, and, and partnership. And I think that was, that was key. Um, and also then using that sort of public stage to call them on that and be like, you know, like two months ago you said you were going to do this, and we're doing it. So, and it, then he came in, and, and also at the end of the day, I think this, the work spoke for itself. If, if he had come in and it was just a clunky bunch of whatever, the, the training manuals the teams made are incredibly powerful. The art that they made is just mind-blowing to me. Um, so I think there's a lot of answers to that question, but it was a long process of um, conversation, community building, and not, not being explicit maybe about politics ahead of time and being welcoming uh, to, to those non-traditional partnerships. Um, does that answer? Hi, this is Vaden. Um, I'm with the Center on Sentencing and Corrections at Vera. Um, I'm wondering if you ever do any work with um, other people that are involved in justice systems, like corrections officers mm -hmm. um, or police officers, and get their input. Um, I'm mostly worried, uh, wondering about that because um, I think they often feel ignored when reform movements come in um, and and that can make change really difficult. Yeah, yeah. Usually the, or unions, um, all kinds of things. So um, I'm pro-union. I just meant like uh, <laughs> correctional officer unions. Um, so yes, I have a bunch. Um, I just didn't show everything. So uh, in Ottawa, I did a project usually through the U.S. Embassy um, with a group of uh, incarcerated youth there uh, where we created these amazing photographs. Uh, and the facility we were working in, there were strict rules about um, the youth uh, not being able to touch each other, not being able to touch the teacher, so no hugs, no anything, no high fives. Um, and over the course of two weeks, we did these photo and video projects that are really amazing, and I wish I could show them, um, but I don't have them. And what was important was that the guards, who are called youth workers, um, language is a powerful tool, um, they helped their teachers, the youth, and the guards all work together to co create the images. And so the, when I say, you know, the act of the photograph is its own classroom, the teachers and the, and the guards afterwards told me that they learned more about the humanity, about the history, about the struggles and dreams of the youth that they're working with in a week of making these photographs together where they're, they, they're, we were able to touch, where we were able to create these images together um, than they had in six months. Um, so absolutely. Uh, I do think that incarceration is a, an implicitly violent space that affects all, including, um, you know, those that are working in them, uh, their families, the local economies, all kinds of things. So um, the police training we're doing in a couple months, that'll be the first wave of the 700 officers we're training. Um, it's going to be a few days of training and then a big community forum where we share what we learned. And a lot of the training is also focused on the police officers telling their story, answering questions like, what do you wish people knew about your experience on the force or whatever. So absolutely, it, it can't be a one-way conversation, which I think goes to the question asked earlier. If you come in, you know, you just, the lines of communication have to be open. And I think art, to me, creates a really powerful stage to have that. Um, and a seemingly depoliticized sta stage that actually is <laughs> hyper-political. Um, does anyone have a question who's watching on WebEx? That would be a great time. And I can answer your question, too, about the police responses. Sure. Um, the question earlier was about police responses. Um, 
one of the, and so I'll, real quick to like kind of break down the training, the first hour, after a brief intro, um, the first hour was in complete silence. So the officers, there's no like, you know, cheesy forms and videos and that's, so it's very like dialogue based and interactive. So the first hour, the police officers just had these little journals and they went um, in groups throughout the exhibit. You know, they read through the police training manuals. They looked at the messages that were carved in the wood um, by the youth. They listened to the audio. Uh, they engaged with the whole exhibit. Throughout the whole thing, it's silent and they're just reflecting in their journals. And then they came back together, had a dialogue about what they saw, what, what patterns, what, what personal experiences. So to cut back to what you just asked, always creating space where, because a lot of the police officers had personal experiences, had brothers or fathers or sons and mothers um, that were impacted by the system. And, you know, creating space on the, in, their, in, in the department to share those, I think, was important. Um, and then after that brief or that first hour and a half, we had a family member who had a um, had a son that was in the system uh, speak about her uh, experiences. Uh, we had um, Jerry Thomas from Legal Aid Justice Center do a, a, a brief on the school prison pipeline. We had a youth development and trauma informed specialist talk about um, uh, sort of why youth might respond in certain ways. So really layering those different levels of conversation on and using the exhibit as a framing device for all those. In Virginia, there's no mandatory training for officers. So you can be in a school with a taser or a gun or a billy club um, without any training. No training. Certain counties have MOUs with their departments. Um, so to us, if Virginia is sending more youth to law enforcement than any state in the country, and those officers aren't getting mandatory training, you know, who better, A, they need to be trained, but B, like, who better to train them than the youth that have been um, really sent to that system by those officers? Um, and, you know, I think, again, because it wasn't like an FU, it was this is a huge issue that we're all implicated in. How do we get, get, get past it? You know, the juvenile justice system in Virginia um, is broken. It's like $150,000 per youth per year to incarcerate one youth for one year. Um, the recidivism rate, uh, the likelihood of them ending up back in the system is over 75%. So, you know, it's, it's a complete failure on, on every level. Um, and so I think there's an urgency and interest. You know, like the head of DJJ, Andy Block, is a Soros uh, fellow. Um, he's an Open Society Justice Fellow. So we have some, some interesting people in power right now that um, I think has, has really lined up uh, with the project to help kind of make change on, on some big levels. But the officers were really positive. They said things like, I never thought I'd see these youth as my, my or these kids as my kids. Um, you know, a lot of it was, was really, I think, eye-opening. You know, if we look at some of the, the materials that the police are, are trained with now, it, there's, a, there's literally a piece that says, how to tell if a teen is lying. Um, that's, you know, one essay within their training. And it's literally like they're looking too directly at your eyes. They're looking at their feet. Their eyes are moving from side to side. I mean, anybody that knows anything about kids, anything that knows anything about, um, you know, police interactions, uh, we know that that's crazy. But also there's just, like, nothing you can do. So it's a lot of it was, I think, reframing um, how they were being taught, adding to it, and then, you know, I think it was really effective, though. I'm interested in the systemic level changes and that there's incredibly important work here around changing fundamental narratives about who is incarcerated and what those stories are and, and, and which brings up questions about what's just or not, but then um, translating into larger policy or translate, translating those narratives up the chain yeah. um, and also how that interacts and how your work interacts with the movement for black lives. It's putting forth a lot of specific demands or policy suggestions across the country, um, some localized, some more national. Yeah. Can you just talk about that? Yeah, so we're part of an awesome group called Rise for Youth, um, which is a statewide in Virginia coalition of, you know, a variety of advocacy groups, direct service providers, and governmental agencies. And so as part of that, they are putting forth legislative platforms and policy reforms. And so we have done things like the Justice Parade 
or the museum exhibit where 20,000 some people land in two days, um, or these other large scale public moments. The, the exhibit is currently touring, touring all over the state. Um, and everywhere it goes, RISE, we partner with RISE to sort of present some of those policy initiatives and getting them to, um, which are informed also, it's recursive because those policy initiatives are informed by the youth that we're working with. And then RISE sort of has already developed the relationships with those in power to get those ideas and others um, to those voices, to those places. Um, so it's, part of it is developing the relationships with groups like that to ensure that we can get our materials um, into those, into like the General Assembly or elsewhere. We just had a youth lobby day um, a week ago where the newspaper and other materials that we've created were used uh, to directly engage with uh, legislators. Uh, we've done things like um, the budget hearing where we played the audio recordings over the microphone. And we know that, you know, I mean, I, am I, you guys are the experts. <laughs> I mean, I'm not like, I think I have skill sets, but I don't want to presume that I can. The reason why we make these partnerships is because everybody has a skill. And, and any community, any university, any building, everybody here has amazing skill sets. And if we all try to do all of it at once, it's just going to, it'll fall flat. Um, so we try to just make the partnerships with the people that have different networks and relationships and power um, uh, to sort of fill out the gaps that we have. And so we're part of it is creating advocacy tools for those that are already doing lobby work, lobbying work, or policy work, or theory work. Um, and some of it's doing grassroots organizing. We do a lot of petitions and that sort of thing. So we try to engage on a systemic level through partnership, but also through direct action. That, Thanks, uh, my name is Shani Small. I'm with the Legal Aid Society Community Hi. Justice Unit. Um, I was wondering if you did observe fatigue with any of the young people that you were working with, skepticism or cynicism around um, these efforts, and uh, what did you do to counteract that? Uh, any specific instances that you care to recall? Of course. Yeah. I mean, great question. So. I worked with kids in prison who've said things like, like, I, when I was in college, I did this project where I was like, if you were the principal, if you were the police chief, if you, you know, whatever, like, how would you, and often the response was like, if you thought you were going to be dead or incarcerated by 21, why the hell would you care about school or democracy or anything, let alone like, you know, how clean your community or equitable or whatever. Um, and so can an art project replace, you know, 18 years or 15 years of like constant bombardment of like negative media and negative sort of messages? No. Um, but can you create an incredibly supportive, peer mentored, adult mentored environment that can chip away at that? Absolutely. So when we said we're going to train every police officer, they're like, no, you're not. They, they don't want to listen to us. Like, of course. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't believe that. Um, but I think that you know, what I would say was so important and what was effective was having people like Gina in the room who had been in the system um, from a very young age, from foster care to adult to adult prison, um, having somebody like Daquan Beaver who works for Legal Aid Justice Center as a community organizer who was incarcerated as a youth for seven years there every week. Um, and I think bringing in also a multitude of, of community experts, whether they're lawyers or incredible artists or others, help sort of um, chip away at that as well. Um, but I think, you know, we're going to be doing the same program this summer, and we're going to be able to come in and be like, here's a video of like 20,000 people looking at your the amazing art, and here's these officers. You know, I think it's building blocks, right? And I think the Youth Adv Action Network that or Advocacy Network that I mentioned earlier, where you're providing paid opportunities for folks that go through the program to stay involved as they get out, which is also providing reentry services, um, is a good way to further sort of chip away at that skepticism. But I would say people have every, if you're not skeptical, you, there's something wrong, you know? Like, so um, it's a, it was a lot of work to do that, but um, I think also we were simultaneously throughout the summer um, sh sharing the work and getting like local NPR did a story and we were able to play that. So they were seeing immediately 
um, you know, which I think is an important organizing tactic. Like you know, every day they made something, it was there the next day blown up or something like that. Like so, making sure that they're seeing, hey, like how powerful their work can look and and feel, um, and and seeing the effect of it on others. So, it's a really good question. So I'm hoping this year will be easier, but I imagine it's always going to be hard. Hey, uh, thanks. Great uh, presentation and work. I'm Nico with uh, Central Chinese Justice here at Vera. So I was wondering if, um, uh, and I'm a researcher here, I was wondering like what are the relationships or links and the collaboration that happens between you, like artists, photographers, community members, and researchers? Because it seems like here um, there's such you know a wealth of knowledge that isn't necessarily, or it might not necessarily be seen as appropriate for research environments, especially in criminal justice settings where we're so focused on kind of big numbers, big data, quantitative information. Um, and we do do things with qualitative, you know, data, but, you know, sometimes it's looked at, you know, with not on the same level mm -hmm. necessarily as quantitative uh, information. So I was wondering if, like, if, if there are any kind of collaborations or relationships created in, like, in regards to training, in regards to like, yeah. having researchers think outside of the box when it comes to, like, you know, understanding these environments and especially like how you know you interact with those who are trying to have like a more fundamental understanding of when it comes to the criminal justice system. Yeah, so 2000%. Like we, in the trainings, the trainings really happen I think in part because of research like that which was done to create the Center for Public Integrity Report. Um, and then, so what, I'm going to try to answer this. What I would say is that if if I show you a training manual or facilitate an experience with the officer that develops empathy for these individuals as human beings, and then that human being is then put into a context, a research context, um, that says there's 10,000 youth locked up every year, we're spending $150,000 per youth to do that, all of a sudden that human being you just encountered becomes magnified exponentially. So I think personally it's not an either or. I think it's horrifying that they're not more commonly used together because I think it's such a powerful combination. Um, and so Legal Aid Justice Center is a team of researchers that they work with. So when we go to the police department, like we did last week for a meeting, we are able to bring a wealth, and they're, they're there with us, um, a wealth of sort of not only statistical data about Richmond referrals uh, to police, but also what are happening around the country. Um, you know, Virginia has a knack for being horrible, but never wanting to be like worse in the country. Um, I say, oh, don't record that one part. But um, so I think like showing, I think there's a lot of interest when you bring up like certain stats and stuff like that. Um, and also uh, alternatives that are working a lot better around the country. Um, that that helps them say yes to certain things. But I, so again, I don't think that in the trainings that we've done, a lot of it's, um, they, they get bombarded with a lot of research too. So it's not just, you know, a happy exhibit that they go into. It's very much like um, we test them on juvenile justice knowledge, which they had have, they have when we trained them very little of, um, very little understanding of mental health struggles of those in the system. Uh, so it's very integrated, um, and you know the newspaper itself has both statistical and um, is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah, I mean I'm thinking more inversely, maybe more what? Like the inverse of that, right? You know, you guys collaborating, like going to sort of research institutes yeah. or spaces like Vera, and you know, you know, speaking with researchers and thinking about innovative ways of engaging in these spaces which we might not think of because maybe we're less artistic, but, or, you know, or like you mentioned, like, oh, it's art. So yeah. that's not necessarily research yeah. focused. So that's not necessarily data. Yeah. No, that's not the case, obviously. Like, yeah, and also I would say like, like the jail cell where people are responding to that question, that becomes its own petition. So we're creating data also through the exhibit. So, so I, I guess I'd be happy to be, to be speaking to more policy folks, which is, just invite me. So, um, <laughs> but. Um, I think we're running out of time. I just want to give a reminder, especially to uh, Vera's staff, that I really hope we can continue this conversation. 
And so keep thinking about this and opportunities for collaborations, uh, because I'll be following up with all of you to think about um, what we can do and how we can incorporate like everything we just heard today into our work. Um, so yeah, keep thinking. And thank you so much, Mark. Thank you.